All right, so Nam Academy. Um, today's an interesting lecture. So I, I think we're going to talk about relapse, but we're going to talk about uh, really what the problem is. Uh, and this is good for people to understand, patients, family, anybody. So anyone who works with any kind of addiction or mental health, because you know at Nam we don't differentiate. Uh, we don't differentiate because everyone copes with unhealthy habits. That's the whole of the problem. So, problem is, uh, for example, the, the lectures relapse. And what is really the problem, for example, of an alcoholic? And a lot of people come here and they say, my husband, or they, if they're the person, they think that the problem is alcohol, or the drug, or the gambling, or the shopping, or the food issues. Etc., etc., etc. But really, the problem is not that at all. These things, to borrow from AA terminology, these things are actually the allergy. But that's not the problem. Everyone has allergies. People are allergic to peanuts. They're not in psych wards or filling our jails or even our morgues, they're not dying. Because once they learn they have an allergy, it sticks. Once you know you have a deadly allergy, if you're addicted to oxy, if you know you do this drug and it takes you down a very bad path, takes all your money, takes away your family, if you know that the um, this thing is going to make you die or go to jail or get kicked out and you become homeless you wouldn't do it it's the allergy it's no different than if you take a peanut if you're allergic to peanut peanut releases the uh, you know histamines and all of the things that make your throat close <coughs> That's what we call an allergy. But is it really that different when you take one drink and you can't stop until you end up in the police station because you punch someone when you're drunk and that happened to you a hundred, two hundred thousand times? It's no different. If I take a peanut the first time, <coughs> if I take it a couple of m months later, nothing changed. <coughs> So the problem is not actually alcohol. The problem is not any of these negative coping things. The real problem is the disease is that we forget we have an allergy. A deadly allergy, I should say. That's actually the disease. It is a disease of forgetting, not remembering, yadani karna, sadikale allergy hagi. So when we don't remember, we, all of the things that happen, right, you know, jail, Overdose and death, homeless, right? The allergy is not the problem. The allergy just leads to these things. But none of these substances do this once. You don't, you know, gamble once and you end up homeless. That's not how it works. You gamble and 
then you forget how bad it was the last time. You lost $5,000. Oh yeah, it wasn't that bad. Oh, it's, maybe I get it back next time. Oh, I'll get it back. The brain forgets that the allergy is there. The allergy, and then, you know, gambling is fun. Drinking alcohol is fun. Drugging can be fun, if you're into that. Until you take the first sip and you start down and then it breaks and crashes and everything bad happens. And then you think, oh, never again. I have an allergy, I can't do that again. And then you do it again. Why? Because it's not actually Alcohol is not an alcohol is not a problem of alcohol. It's a problem of forgetting that we have an allergy. And so that process of forgetting, we have lots of videos. Pleasure Unwoven is a great video to learn about how the brain physiology is connected. Because forgetting you have an allergy, basically is your survival system, your brain stem. There is miswiring in the brain stem, it's not working right. Your survival system should keep you alive. It, that's, when, that's why people, if they have an allergy to peanut, they don't go back again and again to the peanut. Because they take the peanut, they choke, <clears throat> or if they were young children, they, when their parents said, don't touch peanuts, honey, you're going to die, they remember. Because it's properly stored in the midbrain. The disease of addiction, or of any negative coping, is because your survival pattern gets confused. It doesn't sort right. It thinks, okay, um, you know, alcohol is a priority. You need alcohol to live. The only way you can forget that you have an allergy is if your midbrain thinks that alcohol is like food or drink or, 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 or sleep you need it and if your midbrain which is outside of your control cannot remember uh, if your midbrain uh, is convinced that alcohol will help you live one more minute one hour more you know, I had a guy yesterday come, and he was drunk. I, I had a place for him to stay. I was like, it's ready for you, man. Don't go, don't go out there into the rain. But he just, he went back out there into the rain. He wanted to drink. But it wasn't a drinking problem. It was a problem that he forgot about all the bad things, all of the cold all of the he just got beat up right he even forgot that <laughs> like uh, it, it's just all of it's gone the only part of your brain that has that power to make you forget everything is your reward circuit and a person a family can understand this when you just don't eat for four days if you're really totally convinced that your loved one just loves alcohol hates you hates their family, if you're totally convinced that they're just a bad person at doing bad things, if you're convinced of that, then take my challenge. Four days, no food. You won't die, but you will be miserable. And journal your relationship, what you're, what's happening in your head. I, I assure you, third and fourth day, Nothing will consume you other than food. You will be just food, food, food.
someone wants to give you a hug, get away from me. I can eat food, food, food. Most people won't make the challenge. And if you have a medical problem, don't do it. But the it's not. You're going to be no different than that alcoholic. An alcoholic who doesn't have alcohol, their brain circuitry is triggered. Um, much like any person who doesn't lack or who doesn't have their basic needs met. So, if you don't have four days, then you will understand why they shared it, why they did it, why they, 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 they uh, you know, lie and they cheat and they do all these things. And I have some videos on all that. So, the thing that I wanted to then talk about is what's the, what's the treatment for this? The disease is not about alcohol, okay? The disease is about forgetting that we have a deadly allergy. So what do we do? And really, the disease is, we forget we have a deadly, disease is under stress. That's very important, under stress. It's not always true. Under stress, enough stress, the addicted person forgets they have the allergy. So what's the answer? The answer is, is manage stress. If your level for stress, if this is kind of like your curve and this is stress, as long as you stay below this, You're fine. But the one time you go above, then you will forget the allergy. Much like someone with peanuts, oh yeah, yeah, I can go to any restaurant I want. They get stressed, yeah, 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 I can go to any restaurant I want, I'll be fine. Waiter says, you have any allergies? They say, no. You're more when you, so that's the disease here. That's what it is. And so what's really the answer? And there and we're lucky because addiction keeps coming back. So there's a lot of opportunity to learn. <laughs> it's not pleasant, but it's true. So Every time someone goes back to the alcohol is a good opportunity to learn. And here's how it goes. Every, no matter what recovery system, AA, you know, any uh, smart recovery, no matter what place you go to, it's all the same thing. They all teach this. So we have Relapse begins long before the actual substance. We take the alcohol, but and we think that's when we relapse. But actually, it happens before that. So before that, and I will propose a four-stage relapse model. So we'll work backwards. So physical relapse. That's alcohol entered the system physical relapse that's what everyone's all interested about i don't care too much about that i'll be honest with you when it gets to that point it's bad and it's going to go bad usually physical relapse leads to the aftermath and that leads to wake up And then there's a period of uh, time when a person is serious. They're like, oh, yeah, maybe I should be on the Suboxone stuff. Maybe I should get some treatment. Maybe there's like some, and, and that's primarily, that wake-up call is fear-driven because it's bad. So 
people, your survival reflex is like alcohol isn't as important as stopping them. Right after a physical relapse and you're like desperate, there's a couple of minutes, hours, days, maybe a week of time where you're like, what just happened? And you're willing to do something. So here's, so this is the last stage of relapse. There are three other stages. So before physical relapse comes what we call mental relapse. <clears throat> mental relapse is things like fantasy, craving, I'll say craving frequency. So someone who has a lot of cravings, like one of the palorta, cravings, balakarde, they, they, they want something. That's not a small symptom, that's a big symptom. That is mental relapse. A person who is mentally about to relapse is a very short distance away from physically relapsing. So if you have a lot of like, oh yeah, you know, pornography is your thing. Yeah, I like to just watch pornography, but I don't masturbate. Oh, I like to just go to the casino, but I don't play any of the games. You're mentally relapsing. You're mentally masturbating. You're mentally drinking. You go to the bar with your friends. Oh, that looks good, but I'm not having any. No, I'm strong, I'm strong. Not having any, no. You're mentally relapsed and you, pretty soon if you don't do something you will be physically relapsed. It always progresses. Even longer, so I'm gonna draw a longer arrow. Before mental relapse is what we call emotional relapse. Emotional relapse has nothing to do with the alcohol. It has nothing to do with the drugs. If you're a family member, you need to understand emotional relapse is where it begins. The problem starts to brew. The winds start to get strong. In AA, they call this restless, irritable, discontent. You know, just getting into fights for no reason. Oh, depressed. Oh, I just don't, I don't feel like doing anything. Oh, I'm, I'm not thinking about drinking. Someone asked, doctor says, Do you, are you going to drink? No, 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 I'm not going to drink. I'm just not very happy. I'm not, I'm just, I'm not comfortable. Yelling. Emotional relapse is upset. But in non-terminology, we call this stressed. So stress will result in an emotional relapse. That's the second stage. Most people call that the first stage. I have one more stage. Before this, Even longer before this is what I call self therapy relapse. That's the first stage. So, self therapy is what is your is the is the addicted person or the mentally ill person's antidote to stress they do this every day they connect to self connect to others commit to daily practice that's self therapy 
It's a practice that evolves. We talk a lot about it at Nam. It is the treatment for stress. Not just to avoid stress, but to eat stress for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. To harness the energy of stress. Just like I was reading this morning about how they're storing the heat from the sun or energy in sand. And that sand stays hot for months. And then when they need the heat, they, they, uh, in the winter months, they can just uh, let it out slowly. And it can heat a bunch of houses. I think they were heating a small village like that. The stress isn't a bad thing. Self-therapy helps you keep a healthy relationship with the stress. Because we can't live in a bubble. We have to exist in the world. We have to be able to see alcohol and not drink. We have to be able to argue with the wife without going and drinking to sleep. And that's what you build in recovery. You build self-therapy. The stronger it is, the more effective it is. And this is the one thing that comes before every single relapse I've ever seen as an addiction doctor. But no patient sees it in themselves. If I ask them, when they're at the physical relapse, what happened? They don't come tell me this. They don't tell me, oh, I stopped meditating. I stopped going to the Gurdwara, I stopped uh, praying, I stopped... Uh, you know, a lot of family members, they actually stop. As long as this isn't happening, they criticize their loved ones for doing this stuff. And it is the most foolish thing. It makes sense why they do it. You know, someone's drank and drugged for four, 20 years, now you're never available, you're going to meetings all the time. They're going to meetings all the time to avoid the emotional relapse. And the thing about addiction, addiction is simple. It's the simple guarantee that this is going, once it gets to this, it's going to happen. And so, a loved one would be wise if, you're, if your loved one has, goes to a treatment program. And they, they, at the treatment program, they learn, okay, I need 30 minutes of meditation. A loved one would be very wise to support that. And not think of it as 30 minutes being selfish. What's selfish is him or her you know, how many minutes do you spend up, dollars do you spend bailing out your husband at the police stair, at the police? Or one lady was here the other day. She had a busy day all day, and then her drunk husband called her, and it was a big fight and stuff. Like, how much time did that take her? I assure you, whatever it took, it was less than the 30 minutes of meditation. A person in recovery has to have a self-therapy practice. When that relapses, it always turns into emotional relapse. When that uh, uh, does not get addressed, it always goes to mental relapse. It cannot happen. It is a 100% guarantee. It's how the brain is wired. It's, I turn on my car. If all, everything is maintained, it's going to turn on. You leave a person with addiction, or a strong negative coping problem, eating disorder, you leave them in a state of restlessness, irritable discontent, stressed, they will go to what they know. And they'll start thinking about it. And if they stay in that, they will absolutely do that thing. And when they start doing that thing, they're going to do it again and again. Until it destroys them, it's going to then lead to the aftermath, the bad thing, because something bad always happens, which will lead to the wake-up call. Yeah. And the disease of addiction is this is going to happen. In fact, this is going to play out thousands, tens of thousands of times, hundreds 
before anyone ever sees me. So it becomes wired. Every time it happens, it becomes faster, faster, deeper, stronger. That's the disease of addiction. It's just simply repetition. My senses says, Rabir, if you swing the sword like this, and it's wrong, that's one more thing you have to undo in your head. So the better you're slow, and you learn to swing it right, versus just doing lots of things really fast. Because the more we repeat the bad thing, the harder it is to unlearn it. And that's why so much addiction is treatment resistant. So what today is about is to build the perspective that self-therapy is always the first thing that goes in every relapse. So that's good. Because you know what? You can do a daily inventory. Every day, you can even just make it a pattern to do a daily checklist. You can inventory it. There's a thing called the personal craziness index. where you rate your life in seven ways. If part of your self-therapy is making your bed every day, and for the last week you realize, hey, I haven't made my bed, it doesn't matter if you're thinking about alcohol, it doesn't matter if, you're, if, you, if it's your loved one. Hey, honey, you haven't made the bed in seven days. In that wife's mind, it shouldn't be that he's, he's messy, he's this or that, it should be, Self-therapy relapse. Oh my God. The earlier you catch it, the easier it is to do something about it. The later it goes, the more messed up it's going to be and the more time consuming. So when someone's in a state of mental relapse, it takes a lot of talking. It takes a lot of planning. It takes a lot of energy to terminate that and to keep it from going there. If someone's in a state of stress, it takes a lot of stuff stuff but not as much so if you're bothered go see someone but in the self therapy it doesn't take that much to restart so a loved one could say hey a, a, a person in recovery usually when they've woken up right they've woken up so a really good thing to do when the wake up call happens when they've woken up is to uh, make a plan. Make a plan for each of these. With someone you're around, because someone else will notice it in you first. So if you live with your family, if you live in a sober living facility, like Nam Nawaz, and you see your buddy, he stops meditating. It shouldn't be in your head that, oh yeah, he's just, he's just doing what he likes. It should be, oh my God. Self-therapy relapse has happened. We know what happens next. But what do most people do? They ignore it. They, they make excuses. This is why I tell them, I know what it is. When I see one of the guys in recovery watching a movie all day, I know what's coming. Sooner rather than later, I know what comes. And it isn't that good. Because when the daily practice is neglected, so I don't make too much of a headache about it. I just, I try to have a plan for this. I try to have a plan for when emotional relapse happens. Have a plan for mental relapse. And when physical relapse happens, don't wait until it happens. Have a plan. Talk to your wife. If you're the family and your addicted husband or wife is doing well, you know this is going to come. This is the disease. There's four scenarios you can plan for. This plan is going to take a lot of energy, a lot of people. This plan won't take much. It might just be a gentle conversation. The, you know, this plan, if they're emotionally relapsed, won't take as much. But it'll take a lot more because they're upset. It takes, it's going to take time. It's going to take patience. 
mental relapse is going to take a lot of time. Maybe it's going to actually, you know, take a trip to Dr. Gill or something. Physical relapse, even Dr. Gill can't help. Not without medication or something, and it's just bad, or treatment program or something. But my point is, why let it get so bad? Because it's so predictable, it's so obvious, but the disease is that we forget we have an allergy. That's the disease. So you're dealing with someone who's forgetful. They're forgetful that they they forget they're gonna uh, that they they that if they don't do their self therapy, everyone uh, leaving the treatment center, everyone gets this. The disease is not the inability to get this. People are not mentally retarded or stupid. They get this. The disease is that they progress. They forget and they progress, and no one around them helps them figure it out, and they don't have a plan. The further along you go, the more amygdala. So the further along we go, the more amygdala is activated, and the less reasoning ability a person has. Less. That's why they need more energy. That's why they need more brains around them. That's why we say, call someone. When it's mild, you might be able to help yourself. If you're a family member, when you detect self-therapy relapse, you should have a plan. That plan should involve soft love. Hey, honey, can you do this? And also for a, I don't need that. Okay, honey, if you think you don't need that, I, I think I'm going to have to draw this boundary. I don't think I'm going to be sleeping with you in your bed anymore. I'm going to go sleep in the other room because I don't like to see this. Oh. Oh, I didn't see, I didn't think it was that, oh, okay, okay. You see, that can result in a wake-up call. It doesn't have to be, you have to be kicked out of the house, but if you let it get to, you know, physical relapse, it might need to be. Families need to be involved, any, any family of being, any family of circumstance, need to be heavily involved, social network, needs to be heavily involved in the plan. Make the plan, in any of these, right? Plan one, plan two, plan three, plan four. And if it happens, okay, it happened. What do we do in recovery? Then we look at it again. We say, okay, where did this all go wrong? What can we do better next time? And it's so beautiful when families do this with their loved ones because it's a very healing thing to make a plan. Your loved one doesn't want this bad stuff. So that's what today is about. Relapse, what is it really about? This is what it's really about. Whatever you think it's about, this is what it's really about. The neurobiology supports this. If long as we keep to our therapy, self-therapy practice will always bring your stress down. And as long as you can keep it down the threshold, you won't get into a problem. A person with an addiction can live the normalest life, the healthiest life, the beautiful, actually, in fact, the most beautiful life. Because they've dealt with all their history, their trauma, their problems, they're enjoying life. The hard work ha is the person with the addiction. You know, a person with addiction, their threshold is just a little deeper. So maybe. You know, my threshold might be up here, but my stress rarely, never gets that high, and I have so much tolerance. A person with addiction, their threshold might be here, or a person with a lot of trauma, their, their threshold will be lower. That's all that's different. But all of them respond to self-therapy, and all of them fit this pattern. So arm yourself with the knowledge, make the plans. Don't believe anything I say. Try it and see. So I'm going to pause the video. I'm going to take some questions. Okay. All right. So we have some questions. So uh, uh, go ahead. So, uh, Dr. Gill, it's a, it's a bit of a question and a bit of a statement. Um, what you're saying, uh, what I recognize about myself, I, I, 
in the last 30 months in my recovery, uh, I've never relapsed back to, to the drug, but I've had all kinds of other uh, different types of relapses that I didn't really realize at the time were relapses. And I attribute that to my daily practice not being as strong as it is today. But now that I have a much stronger daily practice, and uh, I do two sort of main meditations a day, and then uh, two other, I call them minor meditations a day, uh, uh, which involve uh, um, uh, uh, tapping and flash. My two major meditations a day, what I'm finding is that uh, uh, there's a certain, uh, uh, in my meditation, I always bring along a, a, my animal, or my protector, a couple of younger Jameses, and then uh, now I'm incorporating sort of a, a, my own higher power and, and I'm really uh, asking for help and, and, and uh, have, a, have questions for, for that higher power. And, and that's really helping uh, guide me along now. Um, but what I've been finding is in the last little while, as there's certain stresses in my life that um, are, are just there and, and un unavoidable, that um, my meditation, those two main meditations, it's taking me longer now to get to that place in my meditation where I feel comfortable and I feel like um, it's, it's going to be beneficial. Is there, a, is there a way to, um, whether, okay. is, is there a way to, to have the, to, to activate the meditation even sort of more quickly, or is it just sort of a matter of time? Because I, I will sit there for a half hour or 40 minutes, however long it takes until I actually feel like, oh, this is this is beneficial for me now. Mm -hmm. it, it didn't used to be that way, um, and it's it's not gonna always be that way. Um, but, but lately, um, I, I've been finding it sort of more difficult to sort of reach that point in my meditation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I know it's beneficial for me. Is, is there a way to, to work through that in there? Yes. The answer is, is practice. So uh, actually, contrary to most people's uh, belief, meditation is not always a pleasant experience. Meditation isn't always like, oh, I feel so relaxed. I had a great, oh, just like I took a nap. It's not like that at all, actually. But don't think that if you... If your mind is going crazy as you're meditating, you're doing something very productive. It's time well spent. Even if it doesn't feel relaxing, it's time spent doing that. What people's self-therapy practice does over time is it changes. So you might have to, for example, if you're under a lot of stress right now, stress makes it harder to focus. But there's lots of ways you can deal with stress. So meditating is closing the eyes, mantra, or some kind of thing. But maybe something else can be used, like flash, or breathing, or uh, 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 maybe something like a gong, or a music, or, or an exercise. Like actually exercising can be used to just channel that exercise, that energy. Sometimes, I, I, I oftentimes do the you know, if you're angry, the angry towel technique or tapping. Mixing the different modalities will help you peel off the stress so that it doesn't take you as much time. But that it does happen to everyone. And that's why we encourage learning. Encourage talking to others. Connecting to others is usually to learn about their self-therapy practice. So connecting to others for purposes not just for funsies, but to learn. Because the nature of the disease is to forget, right? We establish that. Forget that you have the allergy. So if you do something every day, you'll never forget. Because at least you do it every day, you'll remember, okay, that for that 24 hours, you're good. You're going to remember alcohol, allergy, drugs, allergy. Now, another thing you said, two years sober. You don't really think about that. But I bet there's other things you think about. Because the nature of addiction and mental health and negative coping in general is it changes. From one to another to another. 
And so maybe it's not addiction to drugs, maybe it becomes smoking. Maybe it, become, it was crack cocaine and it becomes alcohol. Maybe it was alcohol and then it becomes drama and relationships and sex. Maybe it's workaholism. But whatever it is, it's this. And whatever it is, it, you will always go back to your primary substance if enough stress comes. So some say, oh, what's the problem with working? I make lots of money. I don't, I, I'm glad you make lots of money. Trouble is, is with that money, you're going to go to alcohol someday. And you're going to neglect your kids. And those kids are going to become alcoholics or have other problems. So your family doesn't heal when you find other things. Daily self-therapy keeps you from forgetting. Stopping self-therapy doesn't lead to instantaneous, instant. you don't relapse the next day, next week. Oftentimes self-therapy gives you the confidence that you can do stuff. So you get really busy and you lose time for your self-therapy. And then that stops, and you're fine for a day, a couple of days, a week, a couple of weeks. But the system is churning in your system, and you just don't know it. And then you end up depressed. Stay in that, you end up... So this is... Uh, um, uh, people in recovery have to engineer their lives around this reality. That's the only difference between someone who doesn't have a severe addiction and anyone else. But most of society has a severe something. Most of the society is in a persistent state of emotional relapse. We just don't know what their substance is, we just don't know what they do, but if someone's persistently in this state, we, we don't know what they do, but they're doing something. <laughs> it might not be a drug, it might not be anything illegal, but there's something going on. So. Does that answer your question? Yes, and I, I'd just like to say that uh, in a way I'm kind of happy um, uh, that I have this uh, the sort of extra stress because it, it has made me uh, just be very focused on, on doing my uh, daily routines. And so I, I wonder if my life was, was perfect, it doesn't happen to people where then they just forget about doing their um, self-therapy. Um, well, once life is cooking along nicely and everything's good, you just forget about your self-therapy. That hasn't happened to me, but I'm worried that it might. It happens to everyone. And the life, the problems of stress, being stress-free, you, you get confused, you think, oh, I've changed. And you have. You know, over time, your threshold for stress may increase. You may be able to act definitely. Over time, with self-therapy and abstinence, you can handle more, but you can't handle infinite. So at some point it will come crashing down. So that's how we learn. Then you have a bad experience. You wake up and you learn something. That's a person in recovery. A person in recovery isn't, I'm never gonna drink ever again. I'm never gonna do drugs ever again. That's foolish. That's not a recovery mindset. A recovery mindset is I'm programmed this way, it may happen, but if it happens, I'm going to learn to plan. I'm going to learn where it went wrong, and I'm going to make a change, and I'm going to talk to people, figure it out. That's a recovery person, and that person won't stay in relapse for long. That person will come up and out, and next time they'll go longer. That's how you get to 20 years sober. But it always happens when we're challenged with stress. Just like a weightlifter, I want big muscles, right? I want big muscles, but I don't want to lift the weights. Come on, it's not gonna happen. It's not reality. Gotta lift the weights, weights are heavy. They stress the muscles, muscles tear, they hurt. And then you eat food, they rebuild, they get bigger. And you have an easier time. Without the weights, without the stress, there's no ability. There's no reason for those muscles to get bigger. We need the stress. Stress teaches us. That's why stress isn't bad. Good question. Come, thank you. Um, 
Well, uh, in my experience, like uh, uh, stage three, I will say that the mental relapse is a smart relapse. smart relapse Because there people confused when they are talking about this stage. I don't think I have to go to the 4th stage, I don't have to go to the 4th stage, I don't have to go to the 4th stage. I don't have to go to the 4th stage, I don't have to go to the 4th stage. I don't have to go to the 4th stage, I don't have to go to the 4th stage. This is very important because I don't have to go to the 4th stage. Because people are confused. So the answer is always the same. When you, so what he's saying is mental relapse results in a double mind. It results in rationalization. It results in, I'm not an addict, I'm okay. I'm just not gonna drink. Some people go so far as they put the bottle right next to their bed and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna drink you. <laughs> no, no, not you. That's, that's my evidence that I'm strong. That's an example of confused thinking. You think a person with an allergy to peanuts puts a peanut on their, on their, there's a peanut. Nope, I'm not going to eat you. That's, that's dumb. That's actually crazy. Yeah. But we do it uh, when we become double-minded and confused. And the only answer to that is connecting to other people. There is no other answer. You will not, if you're in this state... You can't do enough part, you can't do enough meditation, you can't do anything because you're too confused. Yeah. You're too confused. But the thing is, is if you, if your, your recovery is purely just, you just meditate and you're fine, the problem is, is you won't know that you're in this state until all of a sudden you're in aftermath and bad things have happened. And you'll be like, what the heck happened? The problem is, is you didn't have anybody with you when you were in that mental relapse to tell you, hey, you're not acting right. They'll look at you in one second, they'll say, you're not meditating, they'll ask you, what are you doing for recovery? Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. They'll know you from when you were good, and they'll say, Vikramji, this isn't Vikramji, or sorry, um, this isn't this person. Um, the, they will, uh, uh, um, uh, and they will um, uh, correct you. So you need people. You cannot do recovery. That's why we want you to be honest with your family and friends. Because at the end of the day, they're the ones that are going to see you. And if you have a good communicative ability with them, open communication with them, and if you don't have family, then you have like your 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 recovery network, AA, sponsor. sponsor, other people who can say this isn't you. There's no other answer because inside you're too confused. You're fighting the in inner addict, and the addict is way smarter than you. It's just no, I should say it's just as smart as you, and it has access to all of your weak points. How can you win? You have no chance. If someone has all the intel about you, where you, you know, That's are weak. Smart, smart relapse. So the way to uh, beat the smart relapse is to add someone else's brain to yours. That's, that's why we say over here, connect to other people. Even if you're good, keep connecting to other people. If you care about other people, they'll care about you. And they'll care enough to tell you, you're on the wrong track. And if you have a good connection, you'll listen to them. That will override the circuitry and you can maybe go from mental relapse back up to self-therapy. You know? Go earlier. Usually it goes like this. It goes back to emotional relapse. It goes back to this. It goes back to just recovery. So the thing, it's a great question. Other questions? Good, excellent. We will conclude that for our uh, uh, uh,
Nam Nawaz uh, sorry Nam Academy video today thank you for tuning in